Hey, what's up, everyone? You are about to listen to an interview I recorded with Derek Davison about Joe Biden's foreign policy so far and the ongoing situation in Israel-Palestine. Usually, this would probably be a bonus show, but I had such a good time listening to Derek explaining these issues that often just get labeled as too complicated to understand and cutting through the noise, so I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. If you want to listen to the other bonus shows, you can head to patreon.com slash danarrows. And of course, you can find links in the description to Derek's online presence and work. And with that, I'll see you on the other side. We are determined that the vicious German cycle of war, pony peace, shall once and for all time come to an end. This is London Court. Here is a news flash. The German radio has just announced that Hitler is dead. Early this morning, the Soviet troops launched a general attack on Hungary. Those who foolishly sought power by riding the back of the tiger ended up inside. Tonight I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. None of Say that we are mired in stalemate seems the only realistic, if unsatisfactory, conclusion. Over a million people here celebrating a day that they never thought would come. A day in which Germany became one country again. Launched the opening salvo of Operation Iraqi Freedom. If the iron dice must roll, may God help us. Hello everyone and welcome to the Iron Dice. This is Dan Arrows recording this on the 13th of May 2021 and today I'm joined by Derek Davison. He's a foreign policy analyst and runs the Foreign Exchanges newsletter which is an excellent source of commentary on history and foreign policy that I can't recommend enough. Derek thank you for being here. Sure thanks for having me. First off I wanted to talk to you about something that currently doesn't get that much attention in the mainstream press in the US, namely what US foreign policy looks like under the Biden administration. Even before Biden came into office and also right now, there's a lot of chat about him being this progressive reformer, the next FDR, all that stuff. What doesn't seem to factor into that assessment, though, is Biden's foreign policy and by extension, the State Department under Anthony Blinken. So Derek, can you help us understand what separates the foreign policy of this administration from the previous one? Uh, not very, not enough, I think. Uh, not as much as I would like. Um, a lot of it is, seems so far to be rhetorical. Um, you know, Biden was, was clear during the campaign that he wanted to sort of uh, bring back American leadership and uh, restore America's place in the world uh, after four years of America first under Donald Trump. Um, what, what I think mostly he's done since taking office is to sort of uh, go back to the old way of doing U.S. foreign policy, which is to um, not talk about some of the things that, uh, that you do, which, you know, policy-wise, um, I don't know that he's diverged all that much so far from Trump, but he's talking about foreign policy in a different way. Once again, you, you once again hear uh, a lot of talk about human rights. You hear a lot of talk about spreading democracy all over the world, uh, things that Trump kind of, you know, let fall by the wayside. Um, but, but you don't see a lot of major changes. Uh, there have been a few, and, and I, I should say, you know, in recent weeks, he's made uh, a couple of shifts, uh, a couple of really uh, meaningful, I think, shifts away from Trump. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's and it's it is early. I recognize, you know, it's early to start trying to draw any major assessments. Um, but uh, I think the two things that I would say so far, are my impressions is there's a lot of rhetoric without a lot of action to back it up. Um, and I, I think I've gotten at least, especially, you know, uh, over the last, let's say month or so, uh, a strong impression of a president who, um, came into office with a major, 
domestic agenda and really does not want to be derailed by foreign policy. And so, you know, is, is kind of inclined to seek, I think, the path of least resistance in a lot of ways. Uh, that may change. Again, it's early. And obviously, he did come into office with a number of domestic crises that needed to be addressed. Um, but so far, I think this is this is a president who who would prefer not not to maybe uh, necessarily not think about foreign policy because you can't do that as as the president of the United States, obviously. Um, but to just kind of go along with the tide a little bit and and avoid any major controversies. Um, when it comes to the things that Biden said he would do, uh, which, as you said, will uh, often rhetorical, saying things like rebuilding trust with our allies, like mostly pointing to Europe. Um, I'm not going to be the guy uh, who shoves other government officials to the side and stuff like that. <laughs> right, you know, right. Yeah. How has, like for me in Germany, the relationship to the US feels exactly the same in terms of uh, how the governments uh, treat each other uh, with things like the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Um, has there been any kind of shift to like or effort from the Biden administration to repair damaged relationships to Europe and Germany in particular? Yeah, again, I, I mean, I, I my sense is this has been a rhetorical thing. There's been a lot of assurances that the United States is not um, opposed to NATO, which was the sense that you got under Trump that he was really, you know, couldn't be bothered. Um, I do think Biden has um, moved a little bit away. And again, I mean, it's still mostly rhetorical and it's, it's you know, because partly because it's so early in his administration. Uh, but you don't get the sense that Biden is uh, enamored with Boris Johnson and Brexit. He seems a little friendlier uh, toward the EU and, and less, you know, kind of interested in uh, fomenting its demise than Trump was. Um, so, you know, there, there has been something of a shift in, uh, in that regard. Um, you know, and I, those aren't, that's not a, a completely meaningless thing. I mean, I say it's rhetorical that rhetoric matters to some degree. Um, but I, yeah, I don't see a lot of like policy shifting, uh, at this point. And, and there is, you know, the administration's policy on Nord Stream has been the same as far as I can tell. Um, there hasn't been any movement in terms of some of the trade disputes that that uh, really kind of caught uh, caught heat in uh, during the Trump administration. Um, so I don't I don't get the sense that there's been a big substantive shift. Um, although, again, I mean, this is this is uh, a place where Biden is not focusing. I mean, there's you can sort of get a sense of his priorities here. I don't think Europe is necessarily a priority, uh, you know, maybe except in as much as uh, he's trying to build a, a sort of united front to counter China, for example. Um, but I, I don't get the sense that that Europe is a huge priority for him at this point. When it comes to China, in terms of rhetoric, that absolutely seems to be a priority of his uh, concerning his current like saber rattling and there was something you just said that i think uh, weirdly unites biden and the trump foreign policy which which was that you said oh he's talk he talked a lot about like promoting democracy worldwide and he kind of combined that sentiment with the antagonism towards china which of course china was always treated as an adversary by the trump administration but there's kind of a new uh, flavor to it in uh, portraying China as this uh, global threat to democracy, as the Biden administration says. Certainly. I mean, certainly there, there is an escalated, I think, um, kind of assault on China or effort to kind of portray China uh, in a negative light. I will say, I mean, you did see... Uh, some of this at the end, toward the end of the Trump administration, especially leaving aside Donald Trump's, um, you know, affinity for for Xi Jinping, which he expressed on a, on a few occasions, um, you know, they they did kind of escalate uh, sanctions over Hong Kong. Uh, they really escalated the the rhetoric over uh, the situation in Xinjiang uh, and and the Uyghurs. Um, you know, ultimately declaring that 
uh, it was U.S. policy to uh, to deem that a genocide. You know what uh, Chinese policy toward the Uyghurs. Uh, that's something that the Biden administration has con- continued. Um, I, I, you know, so I, I think uh, there is some level of continuity. Although I agree, um, there seems to be even more emphasis on making China kind of the main. Um, threat the main focus uh, of U.S. foreign policy. Although at the same time, there is this kind of weirdly contradictory sense, uh, which is correct, that uh, there are big challenges, kind of global challenges looming on the horizon that the Biden administration uh, and Biden himself have said they want to uh, address or start to address, like climate change. Uh, We're already living through uh, a pandemic and, and that, you know, there could be more to come. And, uh, you know, clearly the global response uh, to that kind of a crisis needs some work. Uh, so there's a sense that these these kinds of big global challenges need to be taken on and they can't be taken on uh, in an environment in which the United States and China are at odds with one another in sort of a, the new Cold War, as you you know see people uh, uh, kind of talk about. Um, so there is this weirdly, you know, divergent, strand of thinking or of, you know, rhetoric coming out of the Biden administration about also while we're demonizing China and kind of creating this uh, hostile uh, relationship, we're also going to keep working with them. We're going to, you know, or even, you know, go beyond what what previous administrations have done uh, in working with them to tackle these global challenges. I don't know how they're going to manage to do both of those things, uh, but that seems to be uh, their approach so far. What do you think, where does this uh, rhetorical focus on China come from, considering that China is undergoing like huge economic growth, but it's still facing a lot of internal challenges and it's still a relatively poor country, it might be able to challenge US power in the South China Sea, but it's not anywhere close to that when it comes to Atlantic, Pacific or beyond. So where, where does the urgency come from, from the Biden administration to focus this heavily on China? I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it just on the Biden administration. This is a sense of urgency that comes out of the U.S. Oh, yeah, foreign policy establishment at large. Course, yeah. um, and it's it's a situation, as you say, China, you know, China is uh, building up its military, but China has a number of kind of looming uh, challenges internally. I, they just released uh, the results of their latest census and, you know, population growth is slowing dramatically and the population, the Chinese population is aging uh, fairly rapidly. And that's going to be a, a, a huge internal challenge to, to the Chinese government. Um, I don't get, I mean, I don't think that the Chinese government has any intention of challenging the United States in the Atlantic or, uh, you know, there's this kind of uh, feeling within some corners of the foreign policy establishment in Washington that China wants to be the new global superpower. I don't believe that's true. I think uh, the Chinese government is positioning itself for a multipolar world, which is something we're not, uh, we're kind of out of practice and sort of uh, dealing with since the end of the Cold War and the United States sort of becoming the uh, the one lone you know global superpower, put that in quotes if you want. Um, so we're, we're not accustomed to that, but I think that's the, the, been the goal here uh, from, uh, from Beijing. That's a challenge, of course, to the concept of the United States as the global hegemon, the great global empire that, that the United States has amassed, um, the, the sense of America is the one kind of shining city on the hill and uh, the, the sitting at the head of the table, which is a phrase that Biden has used, you know, as sitting at the head of the, the global table, so to speak. Um, and so even at a regional level to sort of say, you know, China wants to exert itself in, in the South China Sea, it wants to exert itself in, uh, you know, the East, the East China Sea and, and its relationships with Japan and uh, South Korea and, you know, other parts of Asia it wants to become sort of a regional uh, power that that is still uh, a challenge to the United States and the conception that uh, most of the foreign policy establishment, I will say that's changing somewhat, uh, but the traditional kind of foreign policy view uh, in Washington, which is that the United States should be dominant uh, everywhere at all times. So that's that's really, I think, where it comes from. And that, that feeds into, uh, you know, maybe a less 
ideological point, which is the U.S. military apparatus and the national security state, uh, which absorbs upwards of a trillion dollars every year out of the U.S. budget. And that money goes to uh, a lot of very influential, large defense contractors. It goes to sort of shoring up the power of the national security state and the militarization of uh, American foreign policy. And and there are certainly a lot of interests that, who want to see that continue. They don't want to, uh, you know, see that gravy train turned off. And China, uh, now that the global war on terror has kind of, I think, fizzled out as an animating principle, again, in the wake of the Cold War, uh, I think China is a, is, is a useful, um, you know, foil for the United States to kind of make sure that, that the defense budget uh, and the, you know, related security budgets don't uh, get cut. This is a, a cudgel that you can wield uh, when it comes time to sort of divvy up the the government pie. One thing that Biden hopefully differs from the Trump administration is his attitude to Iran and the Iran nuclear deal. Re-entering that was part of his foreign policy platform, one of the more concrete points. So how is that coming along so far? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's been a fair amount of progress um, recently, um, the last, uh, let's say, month, uh, maybe a little bit more. Um, I get the sense that the, the administration, although uh, Joe Biden during the campaign uh, criticized Donald Trump pretty heavily for uh, withdrawing from the the nuclear deal and you know kind of remilitarizing and uh, the U.S. approach toward Iran and creating a situation really where uh, you, you know uh, you had two countries on a on an almost war footing uh, in the Persian Gulf, kind of staring at one another. Um, I, I don't get the sense that he really knew how he wanted to to address that when he took office there was uh you know obviously the the uh, the solution to this that a lot of people in the uh sort of pro restraint community and people who were in favor uh, of the nuclear deal at the time uh would say you know you you just undo the things that Donald Trump did uh to sort of take the United States out of that agreement uh and the Iranians have said consistently they'll uh, you know, undo the things that they've done to come out of compliance with that agreement, uh, provided the United States, you know, takes the steps that it needs to take. Um, I think the Biden, I think the Biden administration probably was internally divided to some degree. Um, but I think there was a sense that uh, they wanted to try and see how much of Trump's Iran policy they could get away with maintaining or how much of a, how many concessions they could sort of uh, extract from the Iranians uh, in return for kind of unwinding a lot of that, the quote unquote maximum pressure uh, policy. What they got instead were a good two months uh, where nothing happened. Um, you know, there was no movement uh, to rejoin the deal. There was no, or to resurrect the deal rather. Uh, there was really, you know, just intransigence and the Iranians refused to give any ground and the administration kept saying, well, uh, they need to do this, they need to do that. And then we'll come back into uh, our compliance with the agreement, which was not a non-starter for the Iranians. Uh, as I say, over the last month, maybe, you know, uh, a bit more than that, there's been an initiative uh, led, I think, by, by uh, the European countries, Germany, France, uh, the UK, um, to start talking about re-entering, getting both countries to re-enter the agreement. Now, the United States isn't directly party to those negotiations. Iran is, but the U.S. is sort of indirectly participating. Uh, and it seems like uh, the Biden administration has uh, shown more flexibility uh, to, you know, in terms of what it's prepared to do to restore the kind of pre-Trump status quo. Um, what's happened now, because I think in part because of those two missed uh, lost months, uh, Iran is about to start the, the heat of its presidential campaign. It's got an election coming up next month. Uh, they're about to get into the, the heat of that. Um, so their internal political situation is unsettled. Um, there's a, a strong, uh, I think, sense to or kind of impetus to 
take things a little bit slower and see what happens on the, the domestic front before they make any uh, big foreign policy changes. Um, and so, you know, you're starting to, after, you know, making a, a fair amount of progress in the early stages of these negotiations, you're starting to see the Iranians now kind of hesitating and uh, slowing down and, and, you know, bickering a little bit over uh, details of, of what might happen next. And I, I feel like those two, lost months. I, at this point, I feel like there will be an agreement at some point, but those two lost months could still be, uh, could still wind up being um, you know, destructive in terms of uh, uh, restoring the agreement and getting things back on a, a more stable footing. Do you think it's realistic that the agreement might not actually end up happening if a more hardline force emerges victorious out of the Iranian elections? I mean, they, they would say they have some stuff to work with, to point to to say the Americans actually don't want it or why we, should we do it if the next administration is going to leave again if it's going to be Republicans or even the Biden administration appointing Richard Nephew as deputy Iran envoy who wrote the book The Art of Sanctions to maybe maybe it was just a coincidence maybe it was just to show the Iranians hey like if if necessary we can twist a knife so do you think it's possible that the next Iranian government might not actually be interested in re-entering the deal at all? I mean, it is it is possible. Um, that's a decision that that gets made really above the president's head. Um, you know, the, the supreme leader uh, Ayatollah Khamenei is is the final authority on uh, foreign policy, and in particular on on something this uh, this big. And it it, it seems like. Uh, given how you know readily the Iranians have participated in the talks so far, and uh, you know despite the fact that they've kind of started hedging a little bit, uh, it, it does seem like how many has made, uh, generally speaking, the decision to move forward with this. Um, obviously, he could uh, you know look at what whatever the final kind of framework is and say now that's not good enough and and turn things around. Um, but I, I don't think uh, that the Iranians will necessarily, uh, uh, that the election will necessarily determine that. I think it's going to depend on um, the U.S. Uh, U.S. willingness to look at things like um, the Trump administration's designation of the Islamic uh, Revolutionary Guard Corps as a terrorist organization, which really undermines a lot of potential sanctions relief. And if Biden's willing to undo that, you know, that's that that'll be a big thing. Uh, one of the recent uh, squabbles has apparently been over uh, centrifuge technology and how much of it, you know, how much of their kind of more advanced centrifuges uh, are the Iranians going to be required to uh, dismantle or destroy and, you know, in setting back their uh, uranium enrichment program. Uh, these are these are details that still need to be worked out. Uh, but I think Khamenei has, has shown enough to say that uh, he would like to get to a deal if it's uh, if the terms are, are acceptable to him. There is uh, a ton of other stuff we could talk about when it comes to Biden foreign policy, like the vaccine waiver, for instance, one of the recent developments that the Europeans criticized as a PR stunt, uh, Macron and came out and literally said the Anglo-Saxons are hindering global vaccine distribution. But as you <laughs> said, there's the question of, is there an actual point to talking about this in depth if it was so early into the Biden administration? But we might get a better sense of what exactly Biden foreign policy looks like now that an issue has popped up that the U.S. simply doesn't want to deal with at all that isn't on their priority list. What is happening in Israel and Palestine? If you're solely looking up international press reports, it's almost, seems to me at least, impossible to make out what is actually happening because while the fighting is being reported, uh, what has led to this barely factors in. Can you talk a bit about what has been happening in East Jerusalem and what has led to what we see now? Sure, yeah. I mean, there, there's... Um... A couple of reports in the last couple of years, one very recently by Human Rights Watch that, um, you know, have have been pretty crystal clear that Israel's treatment of the Palestinians amounts to apartheid. Um, and, you know, when we talk about what that means, part of what it means is that you have 
two different sets of rules for two different populations. And uh, there's a, a very good example of that happening in East Jerusalem in the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood. Um, Sheikh Jarrah is a, is a Palestinian neighborhood uh, in East Jerusalem. Um, it became a Palestinian neighborhood after uh the Arab-Israeli war during the Arab-Israeli war in 1948, after the creation of Israel, uh, when Palestinians from all over, you know, what became the state of Israel were displaced uh, from their homes. Many of them wound up uh, in regions, uh, parts of the West Bank, uh, East Jerusalem, areas that were still under Arab control. And of course, that, that region came under Jordanian control at the end of that war. Uh, there were some Jewish Israeli families uh, who were displaced from Sheikh Jarrah in that process. Uh, what is happening now in the neighborhood is you have settler groups, Israeli settler groups, uh, who are hearkening back to the pre-1948 uh, state of affairs in that neighborhood and saying, you know, this property is owned by uh, Israeli families that can produce, uh, you know, deeds and titles that, that say this. Uh, the Palestinians who moved in and bought homes there from uh, that were built by the Jordanians to kind of accommodate uh, displaced Palestinians, uh, you know, they say they've been living in that neighborhood since 1948. In many cases, their families have been. Uh, East Jerusalem, of course, came under Israeli control after the 1967 Six Day War. Um, and so since then, you've had sort of cases uh, moving through the courts of Israelis kind of, again, hearkening back to the, the pre-1948 ownership of this area and displacing uh, Palestinians, you know, kicking them out of their homes, uh, kicking them out of that neighborhood. Uh, the reason I, I, you know, I say this is uh, an example of two different sets of rules for two different uh, peoples is that if you want to hearken back to the pre-1948 uh, situation in, in Israel-Palestine in terms of who owned what, uh, then by rights, you should also acknowledge uh, the Palestinian families who were displaced from their homes and the property that they owned uh, before the, the 1948 war. But of course, you can't do that. That's not allowed uh, because Palestinians live under a different set of rules. It's not OK for them to sort of, uh, you know, to sort of uh, pursue their claims uh, on the land that they once owned. But for Israeli, for the Israelis, uh, it is permitted. It is, it is OK. And, and so uh, what's been happening in Sheikh Jarrah has been this sort of systematic um, eviction, dispossession, displacement uh, of Palestinian families where you have Israeli settlers just kind of moving into homes uh, that these families have occupied for decades. Uh, and that led into a, a very uh, kind of uh, more violent Ramadan than usual and, and heavy protests, um, a, a, a violent response to those protests by uh, Israeli security forces in and around uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque in East Jerusalem. And, uh, you know, hundreds of people were injured in those class, those, you know, kind of confrontations, really assaults by Israeli security forces armed with, uh, you know, grenades and rubber tip bullets and, and uh, all manner of things. Um, and then in response to that, uh, on Monday, uh, you had uh, Hamas and Islamic Jihad in, in Gaza begin firing rockets out of out of Gaza that uh, has then sparked this uh, much bigger conflict. What I think is somewhat frustrating is that when something like this happens, as in Sheikh Jarrah, it's all, some people like cycle back to, oh, you know, this this has been going on forever, blah, blah, blah. It's complicated. All this obfuscation when the settlers and the Israeli government are making it more and more clear what their intention is. This comes courtesy of the New York Times, where the deputy major of Jerusalem, one of them said, of course, these evictions are part of a wider strategy of installing, quote, layers of Jews throughout East Jerusalem. That policy, Mr. King said, is the way to secure the future of Jerusalem as a Jewish capital for the Jewish people, end quote. I mean, it can't get more explicit than that. Like, you don't even have, need human rights watch or whatever to say this is an apartheid state when they're being this open about evicting people not for being in hamas or being terrorists merely for being palestinians i mean this is this is the ethno state this is what all the 
liberals were terrified of, the alt-right and the Trump administration wanting for the United States, it is reality in Israel and the occupied territories, wouldn't you say? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, you. it's interesting. If you find the right uh, official in Israel or the right you know, member of a, uh, one of the settler communities, they'll tell you exactly what they're doing. Um, the, the Israeli government will kind of obfuscate this and, and try to paint a, a, a more pleasing picture. But the, the, often you will find, you know, somebody admitting that what's going on here is um, an ethnic cleansing. I mean, it's a slow moving ethnic cleansing. It's not like uh, what you, you know, may remember from the Balkans in the 1990s, for example, or anything like that. Uh, but it is a slow process of clearing out uh, parts, large parts of the West Bank, uh, East Jerusalem certainly, you know, uh, is a priority. Uh, clearing Palestinians out from these areas uh, so that Israeli settlers can move in and expand the uh, the borders of Israel Israel proper uh, into these sections. Um, there was a lot of um, impunity, I think, uh, that the Israeli government felt with Donald Trump in office because Trump was so indulgent of Israel and so indulgent of uh, the Netanyahu government. Uh, and so you saw, you know, you saw them going even further and talking about outright annexation uh, of the Jordan Valley and of, you know, large parts of the, uh, the West Bank. Uh, that rhetoric has died off partly because of uh, some of the normalization agreements that uh, the Israelis have made with Arab states like the UAE and and uh, uh, and Morocco and and uh, you know a couple of couple of other places um, Bahrain for example um, but partly I think also because uh, the Biden administration while it is uh, clearly continuing the sort of age-old US indulgence, uh, of Israel uh, is not quite so, and again, we get back to the issue of rhetoric, it's not quite so open about it. Um, and so I think, you know, you, you've seen uh, Netanyahu and his government kind of tone down uh, some of their, their discussions of annexation. And yet, uh, at the micro level on the ground, that's exactly what's happening. It's just going, you know, house by house or neighborhood by neighborhood um, through some of these key areas and sort of gradually uh, forcing the Palestinians out and replacing them with uh, with Israelis. Looking at the reaction to these events, um, as you said, the Biden administration was a bit more reserved than the Trump administration would have been. But from the West in particular, the two constants in the response to this, be it the White House press secretary or the or German foreign ministry or whatever, it's always we condemn the actions of Hamas and Israel has a right to defend itself. Yesterday, the U.S. State Department spokesman, I don't know uh, if you've seen it, could, they couldn't even answer the question if Palestinians... Oh, that yeah, that was a, a very revealing, <laughs> very yeah, revealing exactly. video. They yes. couldn't even say yes or yeah. no if Palestinians in principle have a right to self-defense. Right. You're going to know as soon as I read what your answer was that there's a big problem with it. You said, well not a problem, it just doesn't answer the question. We believe that it, meaning the right to self-defense, applies to any state. Well, you see the problem, right? Yes? Do you want to... Do you regard Palestine as a state? I wasn't referring... Do you think that... Do you... Do you, but you, I, but you, you I, don't but in the context of the ICC and the UN. I, so are you I, saying that you do not... If it applies to any state, are you saying the Palestinians don't have a right to self-defense? I, I was making a broader point not attached to... Uh, Israel or the Palestinians in that case. So they do have a right to self-defense. Matt, I'm I'm not I, 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 I'm not, I'm not, not in a position to, to debate the legalities uh, right. from up here. What our message is one of de-escalation. In what seems implicit in this constant repetition of Israel has a right to self-defense without even questioning if their actions are actually self-defense, is that the U.S. and a large faction of the Western governments implicitly agree with former Israeli Defense Minister Lieberman when he said there are no innocents in Gaza. Yeah, I, I mean, that video was sort of, um, I don't want to say shocking because it didn't reveal anything new about U.S. policy. Uh, it was shocking to me that uh, Ned Price, who's the State Department spokesman, was so unprepared 
uh, with a canned answer to that question. Uh, but he was really kind of caught off guard by it. Um, the, the, again, this is a case of two sets of rules for two different peoples. Uh, and the, the U.S. answer, at least the one that Price tried to make, was uh, that the United States recognizes the state, a state's right to self-defense. Uh, well, of course, the Palestinians don't have a state. Um, and the United States would not recognize a Palestinian state if one emerged, uh, unless, you know, it was through some kind of, uh, agreement with Israel, which is not forthcoming. So it's kind of a, uh, it's a convenient catch 22 that if the United States, uh, kind of invests this right of self-defense in states rather than individuals, all it has to do is say, there's no Palestinian state to say there's no Palestinian right of self-defense. It, it, you know, it kind of feeds back on itself. Um, and so. So yeah, it, it, it's um, again, it's not a shift in in policy. It was just sort of surprising to see it uh, kind of rendered in its most absurd uh, way in that in that exchange. Do you think the the intensity of uh, the back and forth going on right now? Do you think this is? Do you think this could spiral out of control? I mean, it's the as far as I know, it's the most intense fighting it has been in seven years. But it's for me, it's hard to judge if you know it's 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 uh, over next week, or if this might spiral into let's say Israel doing a larger ground offensive in Gaza. Yeah, it's um, there's a few things that make this uh, particular outbreak of violence. Uh, unique as compared to some of the smaller ones that have happened, as you say, in the last seven years since the 2014, uh, the last Gaza war in 2014. Um, one is the intensity of the the exchange of fire. I mean, you you've seen uh, over a thousand rockets uh, fired out of Gaza, which I think is a, a a tactic to kind of overwhelm Israeli air defenses. Uh, you've seen a very Uh, muscular Israeli response that has targeted not just kind of military sites, but apartment complexes, office buildings. Uh, and of course, the Israeli justification for that is always, well, uh, Hamas kind of seeds its uh, uh, its positions uh, among these civilian targets and, and uses civilians as uh, human shields, which is a dubious justification. But, um, you know, you, you, we've seen a lot of destruction in Gaza. Um, there's been uh, there have been several reports of uh, clashes between civilians, Israeli civilians uh, and or uh, Jewish Israeli civilians and Arab Israeli civilians in Israel proper in, in cities like uh, Lod. And, uh, you know, I, I, th that's the main one. There have been uh, I think this has been a, a happening in other places as well. Um, that that you don't you haven't typically seen going all the way back to uh, even before the 2014 Gaza war going all the way back to the second Intifada in 2000 um, you know there's some talk of of uh, you know that kind of uh, uh, being the the best historical marker for this um, there's so there's a lot of there's a lot that's that's very troubling about this particular uh, outbreak that suggests it may not be. Uh, easily ended in a week or a month or, or something like that. Um, the other the other factor is is the political factor, and and there is a uh, kind of perverse incentive on on Netanyahu's part to uh, keep the fighting going uh, because uh, it's affecting coalition talks. Israel just had an, an election not that long ago, and Netanyahu kind of came out of it. Uh, trying to to create to form a, a coalition and failing, uh, which meant that the the right to uh, or the 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 next crack to kind of form a coalition uh, went to uh, opposition leader Yair Lapid. Uh, he seems to have made some progress. There were reports in Israeli media uh, as recently as, you know, uh, the weekend uh, that he was on the verge of forming a coalition that would, you know, force uh, Netanyahu out of power. And so uh, to have this kind of land in his lap as a way to disrupt Uh, those coalition talks, as uh, you know, we now is now being reported, they have been disrupted, and and you know the the sort of progress that those coalition talks had made is is all but gone. Uh, he does have a, an incentive to sort of keep this going uh, to make sure that uh, at least uh, for now he gets to remain in power. 
Um, you know, and there, there's also a political, I don't want to discount, although I think it's less relevant. There is a political incentive for Hamas uh, to some degree to be seen as the, the, uh, the power the, the, that's sort of standing up for the Palestinians and standing up uh, for the people of East Jerusalem, standing up for people in the West Bank. There was supposed to be a Palestinian election uh, this year that's since been been kind of postponed. Uh, we don't know if or when it's going to be re, uh, rescheduled. Uh, but in terms of Hamas's rivalry with the, the PLO and Fatah, uh, this does, uh, these kinds of things do help them uh, to some degree. But I think the much bigger issue is, um, you know, Netanyahu has a real political incentive uh, to, to sort of, uh, keep this going and and you know it's it's benefited him uh to some degree regarding the rivalry of Hamas to the PLO and other factions mm -hmm. when something happens between Israel and Palestine when some sort of militancy takes place on on part of the Palestinians there is always like this group this this faction that wants to appear like they want nothing more than to be sympathetic to the Palestinian cause but they just you know Where where is the Palestinian Mandela that we can latch on to? You know, why do they have to be so fundamentalist? Where is the secular, peaceful party to negotiate with? Obviously, this is a huge topic and super long history. But can you uh, talk a little bit about why Hamas is the dominant force in Gaza and the role that Israel played in making that the status quo? Um, yeah, I mean, this is a, this goes back a ways, but uh, you know, Israel. Um, in you know a couple of decades ago when when the the PLO was the and the Fatah party which uh, controls the PLO were the dominant uh, faction and and the the faction that was uh, you know at the forefront of Uh, the Palestinian resistance at the forefront of any, you know, talks that might uh, go on with the Israelis. Uh, and this is, you know, I'm talking, you know, 40, 30, 40 years ago. Um, the Israelis supported uh, or kind of under the table kind of uh, shepherded or supported the creation of Hamas, which emerged out of uh, the Palestinian Muslim Brotherhood movement um, as a counterweight, as a way to undermine Uh, the PLO and undermine Fatah. Uh, I don't know that they intended it to, to, to become what it's become. Uh, although certainly, you know, if you're a, a strident kind of uh, uh, hardline Israeli who doesn't want to negotiate, uh, isn't interested in, in the quote unquote two state solution, uh, then Hamas is a very convenient foe because you can uh, more easily justify kind of not negotiating with them. Um, so yeah, I mean, the Israelis were involved in the in kind of the early years kind of shepherding uh, the creation of Hamas. There's a, a lot of evidence to suggest that. Um, and, you know, nowadays, the, there is a, a sense of, uh, uh, again, kind of Hamas being the main foe, I guess, of the Israeli military and the Israeli government uh, in terms of the Palestinians. So when things get uh, tense and when Palestinian popular opinion kind of really turns on Israel, uh, Hamas benefits from that. And it, it sort of feeds into the uh, uh, intransigence of the conflict, which is, is good for somebody like Netanyahu, who relies a lot on uh, the support of settler parties and very hard right uh, political parties who don't want anything to do with uh, any kind of negotiation with the Palestinians. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it, it is a sort of uh, self-fulfilling prophecy in a way, I guess, for the Israeli right to kind of, uh, uh, you know, rely on Hamas to, to make its case uh, against, uh, 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 you know, diplomatic solution to the, this, this crisis. You hinted, At this earlier, but given that Israel is more and more normalizing its relationship with other Arab states, what has the response been from the Arab world so far, or is there even is that even something to be expected now? Yeah, it's been extremely muted. Um, the Jordanian government, which has the most direct uh, role in terms of administering 
East Jerusalem and the Muslim sites in East Jerusalem and is has obviously the uh, the most to lose from any kind of destabilizing uh, event involving the Palestinians since uh, such a huge uh, portion of the Jordanian population are Palestinian. Um, you know, they've been sort of uh, very forcefully calling for the Israelis to to back down, to de-escalate. Uh, there's been some talk of, um, you know, pulling their diplomats out, pulling their ambassador out of Israel and that sort of thing. Um, but from the countries that uh, jumped on board with the so-called Abraham Accords, the normalization deals uh, that the Trump administration brokered, uh, the UAE, uh, Bahrain, uh, you know, they, they've been pretty quiet. I don't think the UAE has has had anything to say, um, although I, I may have just missed something. Um, but in general, it's been a muted response outside of Jordan, I would say, uh, you know, the response from across the Arab world has been sort of calls for de-escalation, kind of the same thing you see coming out of, of Washington to an extent, just the, uh, the sort of bland calls for both sides to de-escalate and uh, uh, for cooler heads to prevail without, uh, you know, addressing the underlying issues. Not to divert too much from our topic, because I mainly want to stay on the policy level. But for me, I am in Germany right now witnessing the discourse about Israel and Palestine here has been so disillusioning for me because, of course, from the right to the mainstream left, there is always unconditional support for Israel, no matter what their government does. And I get why. It's not like I don't understand where that comes from. What is so ironic about that is that Germany has all these rituals every year, remembering things like Kristallnacht and other programs, not just to keep the memory alive of those who suffer, but also in theory at least, to immunize Germans from going down this route again, like ethno-nationalism and such. When it comes to Israel, though, where pogroms are a regular occurrence and are happening right now, a majority of Germans who talk about this come out the exact other end, where they say, no, our historic responsibility is actually to support the creation of an ethno-state, support the ongoing oppression of a helpless ethnic group and keeping Gaza as an open-air concentration camp. So anyway, given the lack of support from the West and fading support from the Arab world, what do you think? What does the future of the Palestinian struggle look like? I think it looks like continued apartheid. I mean, it, it, what what's eventually going to going to happen here? I mean, it, what's already happening and what will inevitably continue to happen is uh you know the two state solution is is gone i think you know it's it's uh been gone for quite some time but it's more apparent than ever uh the possibility of a palestinian state is just it's a non factor there's there's uh no way that that can be done under current conditions um the alternative to that then is if there's not if there can't be two states there has to be one state what kind of a state is that going to be is that going to be a state where palestinians uh, are accorded equal rights and equal legal protections and equal treatment under the law? Or is that going to be a state where, uh, you know, Palestinians, again, live by one set of rules and, and Israelis live by a second set of rules and maybe uh, Arab Israelis live by an, uh, another set of rules altogether? Um, and I, I, I think that's where things are now and where things are going to continue to, to kind of develop in the future. It is a state where you have an occupied people uh, living under uh, the control of another people and and being denied uh, sort of their basic uh, basic rights and and basic uh, uh, kind of human dignity. Um, so I, I don't see a lot of hope at this point uh, for that to be for that process to be arrested. Uh, barring, uh, as you say, it would take a real shift. Uh, I think in in not just tone, not just kind of words, uh, but in policy from uh, the United States chiefly, but the West in general, to uh, not just talk about you know the the need for uh, the Israeli government to recognize kind of the basic humanity of the Palestinians, uh, but to take steps to rebalance what is a, a a terribly unbalanced relationship in which you know the Israelis have all the power, uh, the Palestinians have none. Um, you 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 would need 
a government in Washington and governments uh, in Europe that were willing to uh, do things to redress that, to, to kind of get uh, the Israelis uh, to a place where they're willing to, to make serious, uh, to have serious negotiations on uh, the status of the Palestinian people. There is one hope uh, that I sometimes hear, and that is with a new generation of Democrats coming in and like the Biden Pelosi's leaving the political scene and the AOC's, Jamal Bowman's, Elon Omar's filling the ranks that Israel will increasingly look like South Africa. Do you think that's a possibility or do you think even that time frame isn't even enough to do anything about what's happening right now? I, I mean, I think that Israel is is absolutely becoming a more partisan issue in the United States, which is an interesting development. It never used to be that way. It was one of the uh, the few truly bipartisan, uh, you know, sort of points of agreement in in U.S. politics. Increasingly, uh, through both the kind of the rise of a, a new generation of Democrats who are uh, a bit less inclined to to believe the uh, kind of overwhelmingly pro-Israeli narrative that you get in the U.S. media and from from uh, sort of traditionally from the U.S. government, uh, and also because I think of the actions of. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and and you know his Republican friends who have uh, done a lot to kind of uh, make support for Israel a partisan issue. Uh, you do have a, a shift happening in the United States, but but the timetable on which uh, that shift could conceivably affect uh, the Israel Palestine conflict and materially impact. Uh, the Palestinians in a positive way, I, I think, is is a very long one, and and uh, you know I don't know if it's uh, too long uh, given you know some of the the uh, the things that could happen in the meantime, um, but uh, it's not an effect. It's not a process that could have uh, any kind of immediate or short or even medium term, I think, impact on on what's happening. Okay, so as a little palate cleanser, shifting topics a little bit and finishing on a lighter note. The recent local elections in the UK, and to lead us into this, I saved an absolute banger of a tweet from former Labour MP Mike Gapes, who, reflecting on Labour's devastating defeat, wrote, it will take years for Labour to overcome the toxic impact of long Corbyn, like long COVID. <laughs> Derek, what's your analysis? <laughs> Yeah, I think, I mean, that's good for them. They can just blame Jeremy Corbyn for everything as uh, the Labour Party kind of spirals into oblivion. Um, I, I don't, you know, this is, uh, and again, you know, British politics, I'm not like, I don't, I don't pretend to be an expert in, in sort of the local aspects of British politics. I sort of, uh, you know, just deal with the, the kind of top level stuff. Uh, but Starmer, Keir Starmer strikes me as, as somebody who is, uh, his main concern is not offending anybody. And so he doesn't take, he's sort of anodyne, uh, you know, he has a, he has a nice chin, uh, he's got wavy hair and he kind of looks out in the distance, but there's nothing there. There's, there doesn't seem to be any substance there, uh, except that, uh, Jeremy Corbyn is bad and we have to sort yeah. of purge every last essence of Corbynism for the party. Um, and clearly that's not resonating with people. I mean, you know, to, to lose, uh, you know, to lose some of these kind of deep, labor strongholds uh, to see polling that has, you know, I, I think you uh, attributing all this to Corbyn is, is insulting in some ways to the, the British voter. When you see polling that has, uh, Starmer's approval rating at like negative 45 or negative 50, uh, you know, his net approval rating, uh, you know, people, people aren't downgrading care Starmer because of Jeremy Corbyn. Like they can tell the difference. I don't think people are, uh, you know, silly enough to sort of, uh, you know, be attributing or blaming Starmer for things that happened two or three years ago. Um, he's failing. I mean, he's failing to connect with voters. He's failing to uh, put forward an agenda that appeals to anybody as far as I can tell. Um, and, and, you know, at some point, um, in a in a 
normal kind of media environment, you would expect that he would have to face uh, some repercussions. He would have to face up to his his own failures. But I guess, uh, you know, in this special case, we can just blame Jeremy Corbyn for the next 30 years until the Labor Party is no more uh, and just say, you know, he was the he was the end of the, the party. I don't know. I don't know how long you can get away with that. They just seem so completely lost, the Labour Party does. Days before the election took place, I looked at some of their campaign material and they were sharing images on their social media channels saying things like, vote Labour to put more police on the streets to lower the crime rate. And it's just like, you know, like any anyone would be able to tell you that if you're trying to appeal to someone who wants more police on the street, why would that person ever vote for labor instead of the real deal, instead of voting for the conservatives. And just for the people listening who are kind of bummed out about the Tories standing victorious once again, know that the labor establishment absolutely wanted this outcome rather than be part of a successful Corbyn administration. One thing labor officials did to sabotage their own campaign in 2019, and I just learned about this, and I, it's just it, it's, it's blown my mind, was that when Corbyn wanted them to run a left-wing campaign on Facebook, they took 5,000 pounds and micro-targeted Corbyn and his family and his close allies with left-wing ads while spending the bulk of the campaign money to the ads that they wanted to do. It, it leaves one lost for words. And Labour just seems to be the latest entry of major political parties like the German Social Democrats or the U.S. Democrats, to some extent, who are just just don't know where to turn after abandoning their previous constituency during the neoliberal turn. So, Derek, are we just in for conservative hegemony forever? I I mean we're we're in a very interesting time because uh, look, this was this was the thing that happened in the U.S. in the 1990s, happened in the U.K. as well under Tony Blair. But you know, you have Bill Clinton. Uh, being elected in, in 1992 here in the U.S. with this message of, uh, you know, the left is is gone, big government is over, uh, we're going to be the uh, tolerable face, uh, basically, of conservatism, right? We're going to be the sort of nice, uh, nice guys who want to do uh, nice things, but by and large, we're pursuing the same agenda that the Conservative Party is is pursuing, or the Republican Party here in the U.S. Uh, and there was this sort of this whole kind of third way movement that if you just kind of uh, tweaked conservative ideas, you could win on that as the uh, ostensibly center left or left party, um, and and it worked for a few years. I mean, clearly it worked for Clinton, it worked for uh, Tony Blair, but it, it it hit a wall, which is, uh, you know, when you run that way, you don't have you're not offering an alternative to people, and when the uh, the the neoliberalism kind of uh, starts to fail, when the bubble bursts, when people start to uh, to really struggle again after you've hollowed out. Uh, you know, the, the, the safety net after you've, you know, pursued austerity for 10 years and, and you know, kind of budget balancing and that sort of thing. Uh, and people are really hurting. They don't have anywhere else to go except to go with this kind of nativist right wing uh, conservatism that emerges because, you know, they're trying to carve out a new space now that you've uh, sort of claimed the, the, the center right. Uh, and and you do get these very weird effects that I think we're we're living through right now. And I, I, I it's hard to say uh, when it's going to break. It broke to to some degree here in the U.S. because uh, it resulted in Donald Trump. And I think Donald Trump is a very unique uh, candidate or a very unique president who kind of wore out his welcome very quickly. Uh, but that's not the case in, in other places. And so I, I you know, uh, uh, and even in the U S I mean, we replaced Trump with sort of the quintessential example of this kind of triangulation, uh, third way politics who, uh, again, has done some things out of necessity, uh, that are a little bit out of the norm and a little bit more, you know, kind of, uh, of a return to a, a, a left, uh, or center left, a real center left agenda, uh, but fundamentally, in his sort of uh, uh, kind of core, his political core, I think Biden is uh, absolutely drawn out of that uh, that same 
kind of centrist, technocratic, uh, third mm. way kind of politics. I and um, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know that uh, he's going to make it uh, or he's going to going to be able to arrest uh, that slide in the U.S. and certainly in other countries that have had the good sense uh, not to go so far as to elect Donald Trump. I don't know if the the uh, the fever is going to break uh, anytime soon. Derek Davison, thank you so much for granting us some insight on what's happening in the world. It was an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Do you want to remind those listening where to find you and your work? Uh, sure. It's it's uh, the newsletter is called Foreign Exchanges. It's uh, at Substack fx.substack.com. Uh, you can come check it out. Uh, it's me and and uh, a few other writers who contribute regularly. And uh, yeah, I hope people uh, check it out and sign up. You can sign up for uh, our free email list. Um, and then if you'd like that, uh, become a paid subscriber and support the newsletter. That'd be great. Highly, highly recommend. All right. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, everyone.